Hi, this is James Joachim, host of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews. Tonight we've got reviews, Penny Arcade, Girl Genius, and the Young Protectors. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. Alright, before we rush headlong into the reviews, let's set forth some basic criteria. All the webcomics that I look at will be judged on three basic criteria, on a 1 to 5 scale. That Those three areas will be writing, art, and web design. I mean, these are webcomics after all. Writing, well, okay, obviously all three of these are going to be somewhat subjective. However, in order to demystify a little bit, when it comes to writing, what I'm basically looking for is something that's clear. That is, I can read it, and I can actually see some actually some really nice stuff going on. You know, you've got some really nice consistency as far as the plot goes. You've got almost no real coincidences, unless, of course, it's comedy, in which case... Like I said, it's going to get really weird really quick. Um, I'm looking for characters that, to whatever degree, they're supposed to be likable, they're likable. If they're supposed to be absolute jerks, cool. But at the same time, I don't want to see everybody being pretty much the same character, just with different skins on them. You know, I'm going to be looking for different speech patterns that sort of, you know, different ways that characters are differentiated. Admittedly, I appreciate a lot of that has to do with the art style as well. And yeah, that will be noted there too. But generally speaking, you know, I should be able to tell who the characters are by how they're acting and by what they're saying, even as much as how well they're designed. So, you know, characters... Development is going to be a big part of it, as well as plot development. Um, pacing is going to be another one. If it's a really glacial type of situation, obviously that's going to be a strike against it. If it's nothing but fast, well, again, that's going to be a strike. Pacing isn't necessarily being looked at. It's just simply, can they keep up the same pace forever? It's, sometimes you got to vary the pace. and Well, somebody who can actually vary the pace and actually pull off really well, awesome. You know, the bottom line here is there's got to be something intrinsically cool about the writing to get a total of five. If it's, on the other hand, definitely an amateurish, somebody who's just mucking around, trust me, you can tell when somebody's putting their heart and soul in the writing. It's there. Same with the artwork. So if it's somebody who's just simply mucking about, yeah, you're probably going to be lucky to get a one. So... Again, really poor writing, one. Really great writing that actually makes this a webcomic I can feel comfortable about recommending to my friends, five. The artwork, okay, if you thought the writing was subjective. See, here's the problem. You have to judge each webcomic by the genre and therefore by the type of, in order to determine what kind of art to expect. If I'm... You know, if I'm reading the Peanuts, I don't expect every panel to be a, you know, a Hieronymus Bach panel. That'd be ludicrous. Conversely, if I'm reading a superhero comic and all I get is stick figures, yeah, that's a problem. So I, I'm not looking for total reality here. I'm looking for something that's sort of crisp, that's clear, that I can take, strip away all the web, the word cartoons and the captions, and still have a general idea of what's going on. Like I point out in the writing, I need to be able to tell which character is different from either. So it's just simply, if all you basically have done is change the hairstyle, maybe the hair color, and the style of wardrobe, and that's it, you know, they all basically the same body, yeah, that's a problem. I'm also going to be trying to avoid what I call manga light. That is, it looks like somebody tried to figure out how to do the manga type of art and failed miserably. You basically have no real differentiation between anybody. Um, it's just really boring, really bland. Hurt here as well. You know, if you've got a wall and you put just a rectangle on it to represent a poster or painting, that's a major problem as well. Details matter. Details will always matter. Again, 
this will obviously be a, you know, a little bit of a subjective mess, but trust me, it'll work out in the end. And, of course, there's going to be web design. You know, when I'm basically looking for here something that's clear. I can actually work the archive no problem. I mean, I appreciate when we start getting with some of the larger web comics. That's not going to be an obvious issue. But, you know, as long as there's some way to navigate the, ar the archives and do it in a really easy way, great. You know, if there can have something even better. In short, there has to be some way to, you know, basically not have to worry about everything that's going on around it. I'm also obviously looking for web design that isn't too busy, too cluttered. If you've got a web design that's like 90% ads and they're all animated GIFs and everything's going off and it just distracts from the actual webcomic, that's going to be a problem. It's just that's a really poor design. You can put as many ads as you want, but there are ways to organize it. And straight up, if you've got way too many ads, that's going to be that's going to be a problem in and of itself. You know, you don't want to look at a website that looks like a NASCAR driver. It's just way too much stuff going on, and it's going to be distracted from the web comic. And that's what people are there for: is the freaking web comic. So if you've got stuff that's taking away from your webcomic, yeah, that's just going to be a major problem. So, and again, all these will be tallied and divided by three to get basically a zero to five score. If you want me to review your webcomic at some point, drop me a link at jamisj at gmail.com. J-A-M-A-I-S-J. And I'll give it a go. And I basically only have one major criteria, and that's that there has to be at least 50 pages that are reasonably continuous and end close to the current date. You know, I don't care if you have an irregular publishing schedule as long as it's, I've got 50 pages to look at, and they ended a week or so ago at the absolute most. And yeah, I know 50 is an arbitrary number, but at the same time, I want to basically have enough to get a general feel for the art style to see if there's any, how consistent it's been. I want to be able to do a general idea of how good the writing is. And, you know, obviously if I'm dealing with an archive, hey, I want to be able to go back in the archive and actually be able to find 50 pages and actually be able to say, hey, you know, I was able to navigate this far back. So I know it's an arbitrary number, but I had to decide on some sort of number. And 50 just seemed to be about right. You know, it gives me a basic feel about how the writing is, how the artwork is. And if you've had any particular problems that you've had to overcome. So, you know, if you've got those 50 pages, and like I said, you Last page is either going to be updating soon or was it updated within about a week of when you want to send me a link? Hey, drop me a line at jamisj at gmail.com. J-A-M-A-I-S-J. -A -A so, all right, with that said, let's get into the reviews. We're going to start it off with Penny Arcade. Penny Arcade is the dirty old great uncle of webcomics. It's not one of the oldest, even though arguably it is one of the currently oldest. That is, it only goes back to 1998, which makes it 21 years. That, like I said, makes it arguably one of the oldest currently running webcomics out there. Webcomics itself, by the way, in case you're curious, started off with Stitches and Witches in 1985 on CompuServe, of all things. But... Penny Card is, Arcade is arguably what a lot of webcomic people want their comic to be, at least at some point. Penny Arcade has spawned a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Specifically, it's got its own ch children's charity, Child's Play, where every year around Christmas time, they start accepting money to get game consoles to children's hospitals. They have PAX, which is a gaming convention, they have their own YouTube channel. 
they have a pin exchange, and of course they've had various games and other applications based on the comic. Uh, they've also had a couple of Kickstarters, and so on and so forth. The bottom line is, is that when you start looking at web comics and you basically want to look at one of the oldest in the biz, you look at Penny Arcade. Penny Arcade stars two characters, Gabe and Taiko Brahi. Uh, they basically do look at various aspects of the video game, and they've introduced characters specific to look at video games. All the way, well, let's just say it's, when I say the dirty great uncle, I'm not kidding. The strip has earned a very raunchy reputation for a very good reason. They even have certain characters that I can't even mention because of the way the names of the characters are phrased. So, go figure. Yes, I'm specifically looking at the FF2K. Um, the bottom line here is, is that Penny Arcade is arguably one of the longest running video game comics. And as such, they've actually had a little bit of influence within the comic, uh, with, even within the video game industry. As far as the humor goes, like I said, it tends to be video game based, but towards the raunchier side. They've had all sorts of fun with this, where they've had, you know, they've explored all sorts of areas where, such as the violence and sex in video games. Uh, they've even made fun of how much the pornography is on the internet by having Gabe, for example, notice that, hey, there's all sorts of cameras throughout the entire house. Obviously, I need to be doing a porn. And they can't, didn't get too far. The thing they got the best was Gabe taking off his shirt. As you can tell, the two characters have a definite personality difference, and that's where a lot of the other humor comes off of. Taiko tends to be very intellectual, very logical, and has no problem getting caught up in the details of things. Gabe, on the other hand, tends to be much more emotional, much more willing to do things just to be doing things, and is decidedly not as smart as Tycho, and that's putting it mildly. Uh, at one point, Gabe actually wants, you know, when Tycho points out that you've got a penchant for change, Gabe says, cool, I want one. I don't know what it is, but I want a penchant, and I want it now. So... Obviously, these two characters have a nice little bit of friction going on, and it creates some definite chaos in the comic. While the comic does tend to stay away from political statements, it does nonetheless tend to have no problem going into pretty much anything video game and just tearing it apart if they don't like it. It's just, this is part of the thing about having Penny Arcade. Like you said, it's when I say it's the dirty great uncle of web comics, I mean it. Straight up. Uh, it's raunchy, it's offensive, it's annoying, and that's what you need to love about it. It's just a really great little web comic. Okay, not little, obviously. Um, at one point, they were actually measured to have like three and a half million different readers. So. Obviously, it's not one of the smallest web comics out there. In fact, it actually is its own little business. But uh, the key here is, if you're looking for a web comic you can count on to actually get a laugh of, that's Penny Arcade. As far as the writing goes, the writing isn't always there, but it's always there consistently. That is, it. They've got little problems and little hiccups that pop up every so often. But overall, like I said, the bottom line is it's a funny comic. It's virtually impossible to read Penny Arcade without getting some sort of laugh. I think that's arguably its greatest quality. Like I said, it has absolutely no problem going into hard R rating type of humor. I mean, this is something that if you had it, you know, Eddie Murphy was looking at it, the guy would be right at home. What's really weird is that you don't really have a whole lot of swearing or a whole lot of nudity. In fact, they have almost no swearing, almost no nudity. But trust me, they tend to be really raunchy. Of course, I'm not really sure on how I'm qualifying the swearing here. Let's just say they have no problem 
throwing off an F word here and there. So if you're basically looking for something that your 10-year-old can probably read, this is probably not the comic for them. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a teenager or a college student who wants to see something really funny, and actually had this is it. As far as characters goes, they have a wide cast, and they tend not to really focus on a whole lot of those people. They tend to focus pretty much on Taiko and Gabe, but they have brought in other characters over time. They've brought in characters based off video games, video game consoles. They have their various family have been in the webcomic. Overall, you can definitely tell who the various people are, not two seconds flat, and what they're supposed to represent within the comic. This is definitely something, if you're trying to see caricatures, they definitely have some fun with that. So, you know, they have some really great characters. They have some standout characters. The FF2K has got to be one of them. And like I said, there's no way you're going to get me to say the actual name of that on a podcast. But it's still a really fun character. It's just there's a lot of really great characters and they're really well-developed, well-rounded characters for what the comic is. So overall, the writing is a nice solid three. The art is definitely cartoony. It's simple. It's easy to follow. It Sometimes it does tend to be a little too, too much in the land of caricature, and it tends to get a little bit annoying in that regard, and sometimes it tends to be ultra-simplified in other directions. Also, the characters have definitely changed, and not for the better as far as, the, you know, they just have not aged all that really well. There's just been way too many, I mean, there's been a little bit of details, like Gabe's hair, for example, has gotten a lot poofier than he was at the beginning of the webcomic. And even with Tycho, the hair has also gotten a little bit taller. This isn't to say the art style is horrible. Like I said, as far as my main criteria that you can strip away all the words and actually still be able to figure out what's basically going on, it just a, tends to be a little too simplistic. And, you know, the backgrounds could be a little bit more complicated. The web design, however, is actually pretty stellar. That is, you actually know where everything is. You can track everything down. I mean, you know, you know where, if you press something, you know exactly where it's going to go to. And since it's gone, there's not a whole lot of ads all over the place. There's just not a whole lot of reasons for those ads going on to what they're doing. And on top of that, how they want you to basically put their... So, overall, as far as the web design goes, the only major strike is I would navigate. I mean, I can basically go by year, I can go by month, but I can't. It's a nice, solid floor. All told, that puts Penny Arcade at a three and a third. A respectable standing in, you know, in Penny Arcade, there's something seriously wrong with you. Of course, like I said, this is not a webcomic for kids by any stretch of the imagination. So bear that in mind, and you should do okay. If Penny Arcade is for the guys, Girl Genius is definitely for the girls. Basically, it's a gas lamp fantasy. Uh, Basically, take all the weird stuff from the 1800s that you've seen in steampunk, and just have fun with it. They not only have the steampunk you're associated with areas, but they have also got biology and a lot of weirdness, including a little bit of sorcery every so often. The entire concept is you've got Agatha, who happens to be a spark. That is, somebody who has an incredibly elevated intelligence and is constantly doing weird things just to see what she can possibly pull off. The only problem with this particular universe is that you've got a lot of sparks that are going around and seeing what they can pull off. It's sort of like they're not necessarily... If you're playing D&D, these would be chaotic, neutral people. That is, they're doing stuff just to see... Just to pull stuff off. And the stuff is not always in the best interest of those around them. As you can tell, this is a little bit on the comedy side. There's definitely high fantasy going on. 
but there's also a lot of high science going on as well, and it basically wraps up and just gets a little bit on the weird side. Cajafolio came up with the concept of the gas lamp f fantasy, and that fits girl genius pretty well. That is, you've got a lot of weird science going on that's based off gadgets and biology and all sorts of just plain weirdness, and it's powered by these sparks. Not necessarily in terms of you hook a spark up to a particular device and it powers that device, even though that has happened. Did I mention it's a pretty weird webcomic? Yeah. It's just you've got all these really weird devices going around, all these weird constructs, all these weird entities, monsters, and so on and so forth that have been brought forth by these sparks. And, well, unfortunately, the sparks have also made, taken on the role of the aristocracy. So not only do they have the intelligence to do whatever they want, they've also got the political ability to do whatever they want, and they've also got the money to do whatever they want. And yeah, you've got pretty much a really weird world going on that some or another managed to actually work. You've got a lot of high entry. You've got a lot of really great plots going around. I mean, the only major problem with the comic is that it, sometimes it gets going too much of a high pace, and you just want it just starts getting a little bit crazy, which I guess is pretty much the point. The tagline of Girl Genius is adventure, romance, mad science. And that pretty much sums it up. You've got Agatha Heterodyne, who's there as basically the lead character. And she pretty much is also the target of a lot of other people. Somehow or another, she's had to her personality, and she used another mad genius by the name of Lucretia, who's pretty much a force for evil. Lucretia is somebody who is so evil, in fact, that pretty much any spark that hears about her going on tends to either run or charges in trying to eliminate her. And fortunately, Lucretia has infused herself into Agatha's personality. That is, she's riding along inside of Agatha. And every once in a while, Lucretia does pop out and say hi. Suffice to say, you've got a lot of Intrigue and all that, trying to, to, at one point, figure out ways to take advantage of Agatha, while at the same time figure out whether or not to kill her, because that would eliminate the source of evil within her. And whereas I know this sounds like it's all sorts of seriousness and all that, it's about as serious as, well, you know, a Marx Brothers movie. But Phil Folio has some definite comedic chops. He proved himself back in Dragon Magazine with the What's New uh, comic strip, which we basically made fun of D&D. &D. He's also infamous for a lot of really great book covers, uh, such as Fool's Company and the Myth Inc. Incorporated covers. Um, in short, when Phil Filio starts getting on and starts having a lot of fun, him and Kaja roll out one of arguably the best comics either, and it has the awards to prove it. In short, as much of a mess as I know I'm making of it, the bottom line is, is that if you're looking for something that has a little bit different take on science fiction, and combines a certain... If you want to see a very nice mix of science fiction and fantasy, this is a webcomic for you, and the best part about it is, it's a rollicking high adventure that's just nothing but fun. Uh, this is arguably also one of the longer-running webcomics that has been running around since about 2005. Yeah, it goes a little bit previous to all the way back to 2001, but in 2001 it was just a, simply uh, a couple of hard-covered books. In fact, there was even a point where they were trying to integrate some of the old stuff with some of the new stuff until the old stuff basically caught up with the new stuff. And yeah... It's just a really great little webcomic. Well, little again, being way understated. The thing has, is, like I said, it's got the archives to show that it's been back, around and around since 2005. All right. As far as our scales go, writing-wise, 
Yeah, this is definitely up there. You've got all the various characters. You've got a huge cast of characters that show up on a regular basis, all the way from Agatha's pet cat, and trust me, you'd love to see the air quotes on that, her clanks, which are her ultra-sophisticated robots. She's got a wasp eater, which is her pet, more or less. And all of these individual people, plus everybody she deals with, each one of these has their own distinct personalities. Some of them even have their very distinctive uh, speech patterns, like the Yagers. Yeah, you've got an entire race of constructed soldiers whose entire purpose is to basically go out and kill, and they're very aggressive about it. They're basically the girl genius equivalent of, well, Klingons. Except, of course, this being girl genius, you know that they're basically there to kill things, to have fun killing things, and to charge into battle just to see if they can really kill things. Yeah, it's a very silly concept. Um, you've got this, the mythos of the world is pretty well established. You know what a spark is. You've got gods that show up every so often. You've got people trying to become gods and sometimes failing miserably at it, but once in a while, somebody actually does it. You've got immortals. You know, you've got monsters. You've got a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's literally a Chinese menu gone crazy as far as the writing goes. But, like I said, all the various characters are pretty well defined. You know, you've seen some character growth over the decades. You've got Agatha herself has gone from, you know, a total airhead who's totally non confident about what she could do, and now she wades into battle fully expecting to come out on the other side. And sometimes she does get distracted. That's part of the fun of her character. You know, she's the kind of character that can basically say, Hey, I've got to do this, this, and this, and it goes shiny. And she pretty much starts ignoring what she was there to do until somebody actually is there to remind her. She's gotten a lot better at being manipulative, a lot better at trying to get people to do what she wants them to do without using her intelligence. And when she does bring her intelligence into the floor, she's just downright scary. Trust me, you've got people that see her coming and run. Some of these people figure out ways to fly out of the area. And even though she's the lead character, she's not the only one who's been developed to that degree. Like I said, all the characters in the series have been really well developed over time. You've got to the point where you can actually take out the word balloons, and you can actually still follow what's going on in the comic. And given, again, how big the archive is, and we are talking a full-page comic versus permanent penny arcade, which is pretty much a four-panel strip... You know, that's a major accomplishment, especially when you realize that we're talking, there's some actual layered art here. That is, not only have you got everything going on on the surface level, but you've also got weird stuff going on in the background. Um, you know, you've got two people who can be holding a conversation, and then all of a sudden you start noticing that people behind them are, have been disappearing. So you've got a lot of really cool stuff going on in the art. There's some really nice layers to it. I mean, you can actually get, you can actually read through the same comic and get something a little bit different each time. So there's some really nice stuff going on as far as the art and the writing goes. And it's really hard to differentiate the two because, well, you've got Phil Folio and Kaja Folio have teamed up in such a really great way. So... First off, as far as the writing goes, like I said, you've got a really well-developed mythos. You've got some really great developed characters. You've got a history that's very consistent. In fact, anytime they've only made a couple of mistakes as far as the history goes over the length of the comic, and it's been going on for, what, almost 15 years? So that's not an, a minor accomplishment. And they've actually said straight up, we've made the mistake. Here's the corrected panel, and we've already updated it. Yeah, they've been going off a couple of times, and they, they have had a couple little bit of issues here and there. But overall, this is a comic that's actually gotten stronger over time. And like I said, you've got all these really great characters running around, and it's just all sorts of weirdness. And on top of that, you see certain characters pop up, 
you giggle. It's just hard not to because you know that this character is the harbinger of disaster. And yes, sometimes that's Agatha herself, especially when she's got that gleam in her eye. So overall, the writing here is an easy five. You've got some really cool stuff going on. Not only do you have a lot of layered stuff going on, but it's also high quality art in and of itself. Yeah, it does seem a little, a little toward the caricature side. You know, people tend to be overdrawn. Um, women definitely have hips and breasts. But for all of that, it's some definite incredible artwork. I mean, if you just had to watch the, you know, just reading the comics just for the artwork alone, dude, you get a lot of problems. So again, we're going to be talking another five here. However, we do have a little bit of problem when it comes to the web design. The basic problem here is that even though you can definitely tell where the comic is, and you've got some very beautiful buttons as far as the, you know, direction stuff goes, and you can tell where the blog is and if they've got anything going on because they do occasionally do Kickstarters and they tend to advertise for other people. The only problem is, is that if you look at the right and left margins, you tend to see a lot of chaos going on. So whereas it's really easy to navigate, you do tend to be a little on the busy side. On top of that, you've got a little problem with the art archives in that you can only go so far within the archives. That is, because they've got such a huge archive, what they've done is they've managed to divide it down into the story arcs. And given that these story arcs can take years to basically go through, yeah, you've got a little bit of a problem as far as the web design. So the web design is only a three. That still gives it a very respectable score for and a third. So, if you're looking for a webcomic that's a little bit silly, but definitely well worth a read, this is it. And better yet, it is borderline all ages. Um, I would sort of hesitate a little bit giving it to a younger child, but generally speaking, it shouldn't be a problem, because there's only a few problems that show up every so often, and it, it does, the violence isn't all that graphic, it's just there are certain subject matter that tends to pop up every so often. So overall, it's a really respectable comic. Last comic for the evening is The Young Protectors. The story centers around the adventures and romances of the group of young the group called the Young Protectors, who are a group of superheroes. The fun part here is you've got Kyle, aka Red Hot the ostensible, well, he's not quite the leader of the team, but he's the main protagonist who tends to have certain issues and tends to be the target of all the bad guys. He's the son of one of them, and one of the bad guys has a definite crush on the kid. As you can tell, the wrinkle with the comic here is that it is a, it is essentially focused on uh, gay heroes, which is sort of cool. Um, the really nice thing is that these are actual well-rounded characters and don't aren't afraid, aren't afraid to act as, uh, well as the teenagers with really ridiculously powered abilities. If you're trying to find something that's a little on the PG side, this is definitely not the webcomic for you. Uh, there are definitely almost graphic depictions of sex, and the violence definitely is violent. I mean, there are entire times when you actually see lots of red all over the screen or people dying and there's just no way around it. This is definitely not a safe comic for work. However, with that said, this is actually a pretty outstanding comic. I mean, it's everything you pretty much want to see in a comic with the obvious, unless of course you had some serious conservative issues. The best part about this comic is that the gay characters aren't portrayed the way they usually are. That is, when you see a lot of gay characters in web comics or comics in general, they tend to, well, I keep bringing up Iceman for a reason. They tend to basically give them the Iceman treatment. That is, they tend to make it, you know, a big flag-waving, I am gay, notice me type of deal. In the Young Projectors, there is that 
at least not to that same degree. That is, you know the characters are gay, the characters actually do have sex lives, they actually do date, you know, they're, they're regular people, but outside the costumes. You know, that's what's sort of cool about this. They're not like a standard superhero where it's just simply, hey, I'm going to fight crime on one side and we're never really going to fight about it. You know, they, unlike most superhero groups who keep the professional stuff and the private stuff separate, they pretty much suck at it. Trust me, if you want to figure out who these characters are in real life, their secret IDs, it would probably take about two seconds. But, what's, like I said, what's really cool here is when they fight, they tend to fight and it gets carried into the battlefield. But at the same time, even though you've got some really definite rivalries going on within the group, at the same time, these people work really together. I mean, it's basically, as has been stressed a couple of times, they are definitely a family. And just like any other family where you have conflicts, at the same time, when it's time to draw together and, you know, kick the butt of somebody who's decided to, you know, come in and try to beat you up, well, the family's all there, you know? All of that said, as far as the rating systems go, writing-wise, this is actually a pretty good comic. You've got the characters that are well-rounded. They've got very definite personalities. Even when it comes down to the bad guys, the bad guys have reasons for what they do, and they're not just simply because we're evil. You know, you've got the Annihilator who's there to basically, who actually is there thinking he's trying to save the world. And eventually he does get his reward for doing so, because he actually does succeed at what he was actually trying to do. You know, even when it comes to Kyle's father, who is a major demon prince, that demon prince actually does carry through and actually does do his really weird thing, where on one hand he actually shows fatherly love towards Kyle, while at the same time having no problem using Kyle as a means to destroy the world. It's complicated. You've also got a really cool mythos. That is, you definitely know where each one of the characters stands in terms of the political structure of the partic of that of that universe. Um, there is a definite legal structure. You've got people are there's you can't do things as a superhero without there being actual ramifications. You know, if you they have a major fight that ends up the last arc, and they're actually still having to deal with a lot. Of, of the investigation just to clear them as far as that goes. After all, they were only supposed to have a search and rescue license. Yeah, you actually have different levels of heroes with different level, different levels of licenses as far as what they can do. And the Young Protectors was only okay for search and rescue. You know, not saving the world. So obviously there has to be a major investigation as far as that goes. Um... You've got some really cool stuff going on as far as the actual romances, and these are not necessarily the standard comic book where it's just simply, you know, like Jean Grey and Scott Summers where it's all lovey-dovey with a few hiccups here and there. You've got some actually solid romances where people are hesitant. They're not too strong about what they're doing. Sometimes they'll make out just uh, for the experience. You know, these are basically a group of kids with superpowers and it's just all sorts of fun watching these guys actually grow up a little bit as the comic progresses so you've got a really good strong mythos you've got some really great rounded characters um again my criteria that can we tell the characters apart not always you know you've got one character who's ultra inexperienced and one character who's definitely experienced and the other character who's sort of in between, and there is a little bit of overflow between the two. But I think overall it works out really well. That is, even though there's a little bit of muddling, it's the kind of muddling you actually kind of want to see. You know what I mean? So there's some really nice texture there. Throw in the commanders, you've got the age of, ex you know, you've got the person of experience talking. And overall, you've got some really incredible characters here. So overall, I think the writing overall does deserve a four. The art is definitely a strong comic. That is, you don't have as 
it's not as layered as, say, Girl Genius, but on the flip side, it's not as ultra simplified as Penny Arcade. Now, again, Penny Arcade needs to be a little bit simplified because it is basically a four panel strip. But the key here is that it's actually a really cool comic book feel to it. It is a little bit more simplified than I would like it to be, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are a few little problems here and there, but overall, I think it's pretty strong art. And it's been that way since pretty much the beginning. So it's definitely got four as far as the art goes. Unlike the other two, however, I think this is actually pretty good web design. I mean, not only is it easy to navigate, but you can actually find any particular page in the comic. Um, there's a really nice summary. There's a content warning, which is really nice. I wish a character about the creator was a little bit more than unknown, but, you know, it's actually a pretty good comic. Oh, yeah, and the web design deserves a five because, like I said, it's nice and clear. You can definitely navigate it, and even though there's a lot of advertising, which to me is sort of all sorts of cool. So overall, that earned it a four and two thirds. It's not to say that it's a perfect comic by any stretch, obviously. There are some obvious little flaws here and there, but I say it pretty much deserved it. So overall, that gives PRK a five for the art, or sorry, <laughs> three for the writing, three for the art. Four for the web design for a total of three and a third. It can also be found at www.penny-arcade.com. Uh, Girl Genius. Five for the writing. Five for the art. Three for the design for a total score of four and a third. And it can be found at www.girlgeniusonline.com. And Young Predictors. Got a four for the writing, four for the art, five for the design for an overall score of four and two thirds. And it can be found at webcomics.yaoi911.com. That is webcomics.yaoi911.com. In case you want to look at it, and there's some pretty good stuff out there. Uh, other comics that I guess I better do a call out too, just because I'm a nice guy. I would suggest looking up 1977 the webcomic, uh, done by Byron Wilkins, which is a really great comic uh, about people, you know, slice of life comedy in, well, 1977. Also, Chris Flick and Capes and Babes, if you want to see something that's comedy horror. Uh, again, four-panel comic, but definitely sort of fun. And, of course, I better throw another uh, call-out to Pam Harrison for her House of the Muses, which is one of the best CGI LGBT comics out there. So if you definitely want to look at that one, it's definitely one of the more serious comics we've listed tonight. Okay, yeah, even compared to the Young Protectors. Keep in mind, of course, that we do have a Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash two sparrows. There is a blog if you want to catch up a little bit more information on some of the blogs. I'll start doing that, which is at wcripodcast.info. And, of course, there's two books on Amazon you might want to check out, which are the Writer's Resource, Character Building, and How to Create a Comic Workbook, both on Amazon. So, I basically hope you had a little fun tonight. I expect more reviews in the future. I'll be trying to do more, trying to do a review podcast at least once a month, maybe two. As well as, basically, I'll be trying to also throw an interview at least once a month. Yes, I'm trying, I do have my laptop back and I've been able to actually get started establishing some of the contacts I need to actually do reviews and interviews so expect to see a lot more reviews and interviews on this podcast that's it have a good evening and keep safe